Croatia celebrated the new year by adopting the euro. It's joining at a time when the IMF is warning of a recession. So what's ahead for the European economy and the Eurozone's newest member? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. Croatia has finally adopted the euro, some 10 years after joining the European Union. It's another step in the rapid transformation of a state once part of Tito's communist Yugoslavia. The celebrations might have brought some brief distraction for the EU away from the troubles affecting the eurozone and for a world facing deep economic uncertainty. Croatia's government expressed pride in its adoption of the new currency, but reaction on the streets of the capital Zagreb was mixed. This is the future. Things might not get better overnight, like we used to think, but this is the future, especially because of tourism and people coming here from the rest of Europe. I think people shouldn't get hung up on the negatives. One needs to keep thinking positive thoughts. We joined the Schengen area. I'm very happy about it all because Zagreb will slowly turn into a real metropolitan city. Definitely. As things are getting more expensive all over the world, it will also happen here too. We can't escape this, unfortunately. Well, we'll get to our guests in just a moment. But first, let's bring you a closer look at what the Eurozone is. It's a currency union created in 1999, but physical coins and notes only entered circulation three years later. The euro replaced national currencies, but not all EU members belong to it. The Eurozone began with 11 member states. It's now grown to 20, with Croatia adopting the currency. The European Central Bank, the ECB, is responsible for monetary policy, but it is limited in its flexibility to consider individual country needs, as its responsibility is to the Eurozone as a whole. And now the IMF is warning half of the European Union's economies are at risk of a recession. Let's bring in our guests now. And in Rome, Eleonora Poli, Head of Analysis at the Centre for European Policy Network. In Berlin, Ben Aris, founder and editor-in-chief of BNE Intellinews. And in London, Vicky Price, Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economics and Business Research. A very warm welcome to all of you. Eleonora, let's start with you, because it doesn't feel like a very good time for Croatia to be joining the Eurozone. But how much is its economy going to be affected by this switch to the Euro? Well, certainly it's not the best timing for Croatia, but still I think Croatia will benefit from entering in the Euro, in the Eurozone. But informally, the euro was already used in Croatia, and since its economy is very much linked to other member countries which are already in the eurozone, I think not much will change, will change on the negative side. On the contrary, it will you know, allow more trade and more tourism coming to, to Croatia. It will somehow make, it, make the country life easier because already its economic partners are part of the European Union and the eurozone. So I'm not, I'm not saying that it will add um, much impact because anyway, even before entering the Eurozone, Croatia was already somehow linked to European economic trends. So okay. in terms of recession, the recession would be bad anyway. Mm. Uh, ben, do you think this is a good time for the Eurozone, which does appear to be struggling, to have a, Cro a country like Croatia join it? Uh, I think from Croatia's point of view, it's, it's a good time to join just simply by getting the Euro they will benefit greatly for economically in so much as that the, now the, um, the ECB is in charge of monetary policy and that it gives access to, to the country to more liquidity. That liquidity will come in, will be available to the banks. They'll buy more government bonds with it, uh, which gives the, the, uh, the government more money to spend. Um, you can expect probably a real estate boom in so much as um, some of this extra liquidity will go into the real estate sector. But given that you know Europe as a whole is in a horrible economic position, by adopting the euro and having access to those funds, to more liquidity, I mean, that's exactly what you need in order to stimulate the economy, in order to promote growth at the time of slowdown. So I actually think it's probably net-net 
a, a big benefit for the for Croatia to join them. Okay, but Vicky, where does that money for Croatia come from? Who is providing it within the eurozone? Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that uh, the EU and the European Commission have been quite active in ensuring that there is sufficient uh, support to all the countries that have gone through the whole COVID period and now the energy crisis uh, with special uh, funds which have been raised and put aside for all the countries in Europe. And the ones that are benefiting mostly at present have tended to be the Southern European countries mm. and possibly now the Eastern European countries, if you like. Um, getting a share of this uh, next generation EU fund, uh, the real uh, support that is needed because, of course, we now also have the issues relating to Russia and the war in Ukraine and therefore cutting off of gas and other supplies. So um, there is a lot of cooperation going across. And that was, of course, happening anyway, as far as the uh, wider EU is concerned. You know, for Croatia itself, of course, uh, the money that uh, Ben was referring to is what the European Central Bank has been doing in relation to quantitative easing all these years. In other words, sort of buying bonds in the secondary market of various countries and ensuring there's enough liquidity in the system to keep them going, if you like. And there is special um, money being put aside again, even though they finished the overall package of quantitative easing just recently, there's uh, extra money put aside for those countries that find themselves in difficulty. So there will be, for a while at any rate, support going to, if Croatia needs it, uh, countries like Croatia, uh, but also, of course, countries like Italy and Spain mm. and Greece, which may need that in the short term too, because, of course, we are entering a recession and a number of countries are going to need extra boost boost as a result of this because the capital markets may decide that their debt levels are a bit too high for them to be doing it without some support from the ECB. So, uh, Vicky, you've just leapt forward by two questions by saying that we are entering a recession or the Eurozone is entering a recession. One of my questions was, is it going to happen? Because we need to talk first about inflation, don't we? Ben, it's soaring across much of the world. Just bring it back to the basics for us. In the Eurozone, why is inflation the buzzword at the moment? And how is the ECB, how is the central bank intending to address it? Well, there's, that's a complicated question. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, the obvious factors that have been contributing to inflation uh, already from before the war in Ukraine with the pandemic bias is the food prices have been inflated, that uh, supply chains have been disrupted by the, the pandemic, which has made things more expensive, basic things like, you know, like food and fuel. And then the war in Russia has only exacerbated that by uh, sending all the commodity prices up even higher, and they were already high before the, at the end of the pandemic. And the, it's become, uh, and another factor playing into this is the deglobalization that's been going on. And again, the war in Ukraine is just making that worse by splitting the world into the West and the global South. And all of these things have led to much higher and much more persistent inflation than anyone was expecting. And so for someone like the ECB, tackling this or any central bank um, is extremely difficult. I mean, the ECB has put through some record high rate hikes in order to try and bring it under control. But that's the classic knee-jerk reaction. You hike rates to bring inflation down. But those rate hikes, normally, they're designed to deal with inflation caused by monetary problems. There's too much mm. cash chasing too few goods. And that's not the problem here. It's like Russia has pumped up oil and gas prices. Um, it's also... Uh, the commodities have gone very high, and these are things that monetary policy do not affect. And so inflation has got high and it's going to stay high. So if someone like the ECB, you're in a bind. I mean, the only thing you can do is hike rates and try and psychologically talk the expectations of price rises down, which in itself is, is disinflationary. Mm. So as I say, it's, it's multiple moving parts in this, and it's a very nasty problem. And everybody's suffering from it. I mean, it is, isn't it? Especially, and this brings us back to the, the, perhaps what some might say is the problem of the euro, the eurozone, the fact that it's run by a central bank, the ECB, that has to control vastly different economies of a, across a huge region facing many different challenges. Eleonora, analysts say that Italy is likely to be the weakest link here, that it's the most at risk from the ECB raising its interest rates. Can you give us a bit of an explanation as to why and what the impact is feared to be? Yes, let me start by saying that you're right. The, 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 as far as the monetary policy is concerned, the ECB has some control. 
But then, you know, when it comes to the European economic policy, you know, the, the, the integration is incomplete. So this has reper repercussion in the sense that every time, you know, even when the European Union or European institutions have the power to intervene, somehow the effect of the policy is inconsistent because it doesn't touch the full European economy. When it comes, for instance, to labor policy or tax policy, every country has its own policy. So this has an effect. On the other hand, it takes months for European countries and governments to find, you know, um, a compromise or a deal. Mm. Uh, let's look at uh, the, mm. the energy package, for instance, or now, you know, when we are discussing how to face, you know, the, the U.S. Inflation um, Reduction Act. So it takes, you know, a lot of time, more than other governments, um, to, you know, to make a decision. When it comes to Italy, um, Italy is already, you know, in a weaker position in the sense that our national debt is very high. We have been, you know, somehow favored by low interest rates in the last years, but of course now it's time for the ECB to prevent rise interest rate. But the effect, as you know, it was already said, would be, you know, uneven across, you know, European economies. And the fact is that Italy is still one of the biggest economy within the European Union. So. Uh, the EU cannot allow the Italy to fail, you know, because it's part of the Eurozone as well, and also because it's a big economy within the EU. Vicky, who might the winners of a raised interest rate be? Hmm. Uh, what an interesting question. I mean, obviously, whoever has been sort of speculating in, in the bond markets, you know, some uh, people have done rather well uh, out of the volatility that we have seen in recent months. So that's one. But otherwise... Uh, obviously, if you have assets of any sort um, and you're able to get any reasonable return on those assets, then then maybe, you know, your savings, in other words, you know, might do slightly better. But in general, it's not good news. It's not good news for anyone who wants to borrow. It's not good news for uh, households, uh, of course, that uh, depend quite a lot on their credit cards or any sort of other loans they have. It's not good for businesses. Uh, which have to pay more. And really, the, the focus needs to be quite uh, considerably on the yields in the bond market, which determine also long-term interest rates. Uh, those have gone up significantly, mainly because a lot of the support from the European Central Bank has now gone from the market. The same thing in the US, the same thing in, in the UK, for example. Um, and uh, the long-term rates that people have to pay to uh, invest if they want to borrow money and invest uh, those have gone up quite significantly, which suggests also that we are going to be entering a period when business investment is reduced. So it means that growth is going to be affected, not just in the short term, but also in the longer term. And that's why the, the, the European Commission and uh, alongside the, the big countries is trying to ensure that that investment continues with support from funding uh, perhaps with sort of lower interest rates, the way it's raised in a combined way across Europe for all those projects that Europe absolutely needs, such as, you know, doing a lot more on climate change, a lot mm. more on innovation and a lot more on getting itself uh, uh, perhaps more resilient to the types of crisis we have had by establishing, you know, a, a centres of excellence for semiconductors and electronics, for example, uh, electric vehicles, batteries and all that, which is going to be required for the future of, uh, of the world economy when we look ahead at all the challenges that are out there. Mm. Uh, the, the inflation, Ben, is being inextricably linked to the energy crisis, isn't it? Has it been as bad as was expected or has a milder autumn and other factors that have been brought into it uh, mitigated that crisis somewhat? Um, at the moment, yes. Uh, immediately, I mean, the gas price is now down, have fallen dramatically just in the last few weeks. Um, and but that's a function of both the extremely warm weather. I'm sitting here in Berlin and it's like spring outside. Mm. Uh, and at the same time, the, the the tanks and the LNG that's coming in, the liquid natural gas in order to replenish those tanks now, Russian gas is not coming in, have meant the storage levels are very high. And particularly gas prices, which is very important for the energy market in Europe, um, have been brought down because you have plenty of gas in the tanks and the weather is very mild, so demand is down. But the way these um, energy crises work is that we're at the point now where we're heading towards the end of the heating season with lots of gas because the weather has been mild. Um, the fear is, if you talk to the analysts, that the energy crisis will start up again in the summer or late summer as the tanks need to be refilled. And that large, you know, Russia sent 185 billion cubic meters in 2021 and 
only 100 in 2022, and it can't be expected to send more than 50 in this, this year's season. And so the prices are likely to spike again. Um, so the energy crisis is not, hasn't gone away, but because it's so intimately tied to the weather, it's incredibly seasonal. So mm. yes, it has been missing, but that's not necessarily the end of it, far from it. You can expect, I mean, prices this summer, last year in the summer went up 20 fold. And given the reduction, the huge, the halving of Russian gas that's on its way to Europe this year, you can expect maybe the same thing to happen again and maybe mm. even worse. OK, so Germany, for example, Ben, uh, reporting inflation for December being lower than was expected. That's not reason for, for hope yet. No, it's, it's helpful. Uh, and the low prices now and the warm weather, all of that's helpful. What it does will reduce the pressure in the next season, in the next cycle, which will start uh, in March at the end of the heating season. So, yeah, it's definitely good news. But you have to, if you look across the board, I mean, everybody's reporting double-digit inflation or they're, they're close to, which is incredibly painful. I mean, normally that, uh, that's considered a crisis. And we're sort of getting inured to it now, but um, mm -hmm. we're in extremely difficult economic position now. And as we mentioned before, people like the ECB don't really have the tools to solve it. I mean, this this uh, economic shock, and it's been shock after shock with the pandemic and now the war um, and commodity prices. And looking forward, the crises are going to continue because um, this crisis with uh, Russia has hit commodity markets, and then that's rippled out across the entire world. And where the World Bank was predicting 4% global growth, now it's sort of predicting sort of flat or maybe a global recession. I mean, you know, we're not in a happy place at the moment. Eleanor, do, does the ECB not have the tools to address this? Because it is governed by strict rules, according to the Maastricht Treaty, for example, it's not allowed to buy government debt, and yet we've seen that it does by government debt, and it does help countries in the so-called south of the Eurozone time and time again. So can it not be more flexible in its approach, differing the approach to the bigger countries to the smaller countries? Well, I think the ECB is trying to do its best in the sense that it has, it has been one of the last banks to raise interest rates, and now, mm. you know, it has started to raise it, and it will be raising interest rates also next year's the fact is that the ECB has to look at the European economy in this world. So, you know, it cannot just concentrate on single countries. On the other hand, it is buying, you know, bonds from national countries. So it is helping in this other way. The problem is that there are two different visions across, you know, national governments within the EU. Like we ha you have, you know, the Northern European countries, which are very much fond of liberal economic policy. And on the other, you have France, which are led by Germany, basically. And on the other hand, you have France, which has been moving to a more like soft approach, uh, supporting more like European interventionism, like the creation, for instance, of an energy fund was proposed by France, or also having a more lenient approach towards, you know, um, fiscal regulations, which is not appreciated by Germany. Mm. And every time France and Germany mm. are not on the same line, when it comes to economic policy, you have problems, because those are the two countries after Brexit that have been leading, you know, European policies, you know, from an economic point of view, but also, you know, internal and external. So I think at the moment you have this kind of internal political battle between, you know, the France and its supporters and Germany and its supporters, which have different economic policy visions. Um, on the other hand, I think, you know, the European Central Bank will continue with the, the interest rates, rising interest rates. And I think, you know, the consequences for especially Southern European countries will be critical. But, you know, at the same time, as I was saying, the EU cannot allow, you know, countries like Italy uh, or other Mediterranean countries to fail because they are too big. And this will have major economic impact on the Eurozone stability. Mm. So, Vicky, how do you stop them from failing? Well, you keep supporting them. I'm afraid that's all you can do. And the truth is that the European Central Bank and uh, the EU as a whole uh, have been very flexible over the last, last few years. So during COVID and beyond, um, they have uh, ba basically um, given up on some of the rules or at least suspended some of the rules they had. The European Stability and Growth Pact uh, has been abandoned for the time being. In other words, needing to keep to very strict debt and deficit um, percentages. That's all gone for the time being. Uh, the European Central Bank has been buying 
so-called junk bonds from uh, various governments. So he's been buying a lot of Greek bonds, which were junk for a while, but they seem to have improved a little bit recently. But he keeps on buying those, or he has kept buying those through the entire quantitative easing period. So a lot of flexibility there. There is no doubt in my mind that this flexibility needs to continue, that if we were to revert back to any tightening of the rules again. Uh, there is a review now of the stability and or the growth and stability pact or stability and growth pact. Um, uh, what will replace it will be very important. And we we're talking earlier about Croatia. I mean, what the implications for Croatia will be? I mean, Croatia is having an inflation of over 13% mm. right now. Uh, other countries uh, a bit less, but the Baltic states over 20%. And the problem with the European Central Bank is that a single interest rate doesn't really work across in any case when you have countries, as you mentioned, Germany seeing a reduction in their inflation rate and you've got uh, you know, in information that tells you that in some countries inflation is three times as high mm. as it is in France or Germany. So really difficult. Therefore, continued support, I'm afraid, is what is going to be needed. Ben, do you think that leads us on to the question of whether the ECB, whether the Eurozone, it needs a more permanent two-speed monetary policy to support the different nations in the way that their own economies need it? That's a very good question. And the thing with the whole EU project is that it works extremely well when things are calm and prosperous and, and steady. Then it works very well. Um, but even within that, there's always been this sort of distortions. I mean, the size of Germany and the power of its economy it's in the same you know, regulatory environment under the ECB as the Balkans. And so the interest, uh, the monetary policy rate is supposed to fit both of them. And for Germany, what that means in effect is that the euro is much cheaper than mm. it would be if the Bundesbank was uh, regulating and uh, setting the monetary policy for itself. And consequently, it has this incredible export advantage because for it, the, the euro is very cheap. And talking about introducing a two-speed, I mean, this is an acknowledgement, I think, of the crisis at the moment. And really, the, the plan in Europe, I think, is just to wait for the crisis to go away and then go back to it. I mean, at the moment, um, there's, there's not a federated Europe, but there's a monetary unity, but then even that is not universal within the EU. And so it ends up being a fudge. And we've been talking about monetary policy, and you can change rates and boost, boost growth by cutting rates or hamper growth by uh, increasing rates. But the way the EU gets around that is, is simply by giving countries money. I mean, the amount of money that's being spent on support at the moment is phenomenal. I think the EU collectively has spent some 700 billion euros in terms of support and relief uh, for, for the high energy costs at the moment. And so, you know, you don't have to cut rates in order to promote growth by creating more money within the financial system, you know, you can just give it to the countries in cash in all these programs, which is what's been going on. And at the moment, that seems to be the plan. I mean, Germany alone is, uh, its first uh, aid program is 30 billion, the second one the same, um, and then the third one, 200 billion. Mm. And so they're just hitting the problem with money. Um, to wait for the crisis, I mean, that's the issue, is how long is this going to go on? And I think up until recently, the view has been that it'll last until the winter, maybe the spring. But I think now people are sort of readjusting and um, they're talking about a long war in uh, in Ukraine, which will continue to disrupt the energy markets, the commodity markets uh, for at least another year and now possibly even longer. So um, I think you're right that we're going to have to revisit the, the economic policies because at the moment the policies are about relief. Mm. from these crises in okay. cash and not about big structural changes like you're talking about to to speed monetary system. So not big structural changes. Vicky, do you rate the survival of the euro? Yes. I think there is a, enough commitment. It has been demonstrated actually during the crisis. It survived it. Greece is still in it and uh, doing quite well. In fact, one of the fastest growing countries in in Europe right now. So uh, yes, I think it will survive, but okay. it will need to be rethought. So some of those rules have been too strict and need to be rethought. All right. Well, there we will leave our discussion today. Thank you very much, all our guests, for joining us. Eleonora Polly, Ben Aris and Vicky Price. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Laura Kyle and the whole team here, it's bye for now.